My scariest law enforcement story is either almost getting thrown off a six-story bridge that was over a freeway while fighting a guy who outweighed me by 100 pounds, or watching a woman burn alive three feet from me that I would have been able to save if I had arrived literally 10 seconds earlier. One day while on my routine patrol, again on a day my permanent partner had a Kelly day, which was a common thing for me to get the call of a sentry while he was off, drove him nuts. I got a call for a vehicle accident on the freeway, I-55 near the northbound exit on the Poplar Street Bridge. Traffic often backed up on this ramp and rear-end collisions were common. I was in an area not my normal one because my partner Blake was off. I got stuck in a guy's sector car who was off and would be deadheaded. When I got to the call it was crucial that I take one particular hidden on-ramp to arrive at the location the quickest. I unwisely chose to go to the one two blocks further, because the other one was hard to find off an alley hardly marked and it was dark. When I pulled up, three cars had been in an accident. A drunk in the rear slammed into a guy who slammed into a third car in front. The furthest car in the front had the mother-in-law in it, the son-in-law was in the middle car, and as I said the drunk was at the rear ramming and causing it. As I pull up, the mother-in-law's car erupts in flame from gas getting out of the tank by the back bumper. She is trapped in the car, but nobody had gotten her out by breaking the window. Nobody noticed the leaking fuel. By the time I run to her, the flame is fully over and in the back seat of the car. I break the window and cut the seatbelt, go to pull her 100-pound body out just like a kid. But just before I can, the flame billows over and engulfs both of us. The entire car bumper to bumper. I drop away and lose most of my exposed hair and a shirt. She burned alive in front of us. And the son-in-law. I had to take him to the station and sit there while he called his wife and told her he had just rear-ended her mother and she died. If that was my beat or I knew the exit better, she would have lived. It was a home invasion robber wanted for many crimes and he was leading police from six or more jurisdictions on a high-speed chase through the city and county. I was listening in on the radio and correctly guessed he would go for the bridge over the Mississippi to get to Illinois. The chase went on for over an hour and I correctly deducted he was circling the rabbit hole to get home to Illinois and couldn't find the bridge on-ramp. I went to the easiest one for him to get to based on his location north of the city. I then caused a traffic jam on the one lane on-ramp by ordering one car to stop on the ramp and not move until I said okay. Ten minutes of roundabout chase later, sure enough here he comes. Goes on the side of cars as much as he can until it's blocked. Gets out on foot and starts running up the ramp with me ten feet behind him. I was letting him run a bit so he'd be tired before we fought. He gets higher up and apparently then did get tired and want to fight. When it didn't go well for him, he tried to jump off the side of the bridge. He didn't realize the earth rise fell away to a long drop the higher you went up. He thought the ground was about 10 feet down or something. I instinctively grabbed his forearm as he went and I held on a second. Then I felt his weight pulling me over. I knew I was going over now. I saw the terror in his eyes as he realized he had screwed up and was about to get very hurt or end up dead. I then made the split-second decision to let go. I saw his eyes go wide as saucers as I said bye and let go. He fell 60 feet and shattered both his legs and his pelvis and almost got ran over too. But he lived. That scared the shit out of me. He came so close to pulling me over head first, not feet first like he fell. I was running a solo unit one unseasonably cold for San Diego night over 20 years ago when dispatch sends me to an on-base bowling alley. Apparently security personnel were dealing with a drunken disorderly individual running around the parking lot half-dressed and beating on cars. I arrive on scene five minutes later and I see the contact, and something wasn't right about the situation. As I attempted to make eye contact with the individual I already didn't like what I was seeing. 
no shirt in 40 degree weather but still sweating like a pig, dilated pupils, blank thousand yard stare and wandering aimlessly. I'd seen those symptoms before, and they had jack shit to do with alcohol from what I remembered. As I unsuccessfully attempted to speak to this guy, he starts toward me in a threatening manner. I decided to deploy my collapsing baton and warn him off, but he wasn't listening. My new friend was on PCP, aka Angel Dust. Officers who have experienced dealing with contacts on PCP are familiar with the dangerous situation I found myself in. But for those who don't know, PCP prevents the actions normally caused when a neurotransmitter called glutamine attaches its receptor in the brain. It also disrupts the actions of the other neurotransmitters. PCP distorts sight, sound, and other senses. The user may experience out-of-body sensations that are related to the dissociative effects, feel like they're floating with strange impressions of space and time, or imagine things that aren't real. Some abusers experience euphoria and invulnerability, while others experience drowsiness and calming sensations. I threw the baton to the security personnel. I knew thanks to the effects of PCP that I could beat the brakes off this guy all night long and he wouldn't feel a damned thing, so the baton was absolutely pointless. I requested a cover unit to the scene. It usually takes several officers to subdue someone who's on this stuff and I couldn't trust the barely trained security personnel, so I knew I'd have to keep the suspect at bay for a few minutes until real help arrived. This is when things went sideways. The suspect immediately went for my 9mm Beretta sidearm. I knew I had to keep him from getting to my service weapon at all costs, even if it meant taking an ass kicking. A bloody nose or broken jaw would hail in comparison to what would happen if he were to somehow get a hold of my pistol. Fortunately, there were two things going in my favor. Our department issued retention holsters as standard equipment. Retention holsters served the same purpose as a regular holster with one exception. Instead of simply lifting the gun out of the holster, one has to sort of do a twisting motion to be able to get to the weapon, otherwise it won't budge. Thankfully, I'm pretty sure he didn't know that. And the second thing was this guy was about 140 pounds soaking wet. This means he gave up about 80 pounds to me. I was about 220 through 225 back then. With a simple bear hug, I was able to slam this guy to the pavement, as I was hoping to knock the wind out of him for a second. That was the easy part, but now the fun was about to start. Remember what I said about PCP's effect on the human body's nervous system? I finally got to see this effect firsthand. No amount of punching armbar holds or pressure point manipulation was going to stop this freak. It took all I had just to wrestle this guy and hold on for dear life, namely mine. Despite the fact that I outweighed him by such a large amount, I could barely hold this guy down and he was determined to get his hands on my weapon. I'm not sure how long it took the cover unit to finally show up. It was probably about five minutes, but it felt like an hour. Fortunately, the officers in the other unit immediately recognized the situation I faced and helped me to hold this drug-crazed nut job down while security personnel contacted a paramedic unit under our orders. Upon the paramedic's arrival, it took no less than five of us to apply restraints to the suspect hog-tie him and prepare him for transport to the medical facility for treatment and evaluation. A subsequent search revealed that he was also armed with a four-inch blade. I wondered why he didn't use it, but was relieved that he must have forgotten about it. Otherwise, this story would have had a different outcome. After I was also examined by the paramedics and found to be still intact, my watch commander ordered me back to the station to get rest and start my report. Good thing, too because that was probably the longest 10 to 15 minutes of my life at that point. I was worn out and someone had just tried to kill me. Yeah, fun times. I was working the midnight shift in Memphis, Tennessee. It was in the late 90s. Hurricane that just hit forced a lot of people to relocate and a lot of people were coming inland to wait for it to pass. All the hotels were booked and we had reports of individuals robbing people at the hotels, so we were asked to increase our presence and conduct extra patrols in those areas. 
I was a one-man unit and I observed a four-door sedan occupied four times driving in and out of the parking lots in the area where a lot of hotels existed. The driver looked at me and got an extremely nervous expression on his face and immediately turned around and left the parking lot. I got behind the vehicle as it pulled on the highway and I called in to dispatch to run the tag. Dispatch came back and the tags belonged to another vehicle. Before I could acknowledge dispatch, the vehicle turned off the main highway. I knew I was going to stop the vehicle and I didn't want to wait until I was in an area that was dark, so I activated my lights and pulled the vehicle over. I activated my spotlight and aimed it at the rear of the vehicle. I opened my door and got on the radio advising dispatch my location and description of the vehicle I had stopped. I proceeded to exit my squad car and decided at the last minute to have dispatch start another vehicle my way. Hairs on the back of my head were standing up and I decided I was going to listen. Instead of using the radio attached to my shoulder, which is what I normally would have done, for some reason I leaned forward back into the squad car and grabbed the dashboard radio mic. It was at that very second the driver's side passenger jumped out of the car and I could clearly see he had a weapon in his hand. He fired several shots at the windshield of my vehicle, one striking the headrest where my head would have been seconds before. If I had used my radio attached to my shoulder, he would have hit me square in the forehead, killing me instantly. I was in the middle of requesting backup when the shots were fired. Before I could finish my sentence, dispatch heard me yell loudly that shots had been fired and they had a gun. Any officer will tell you that that's the worst thing aside from officer down you'll ever hear on the radio. I immediately exited the vehicle and made my way to the rear of my squad car to get cover. I fired several shots at the suspect as he continued to fire as he was running away. I began to give chase on foot and came out of cover. It was at that moment that the voice in my head screamed that there were three more people in the car. I turned towards the vehicle and ordered all three of them to let me see their hands or I would open fire. Two in the front seat were reaching under their seats. I held them all at gunpoint until backup arrived, always aware that there was another suspect out there. Once backup arrived, we got all three suspects out of the vehicle, handcuffed and arrested without incident. We found two loaded weapons under the front seat, dozens of wallets, purses, phones, and other items. It was apparent that if I had not stopped and directed my attention on the three still in the car, they would have gotten their weapons and opened fire on me. Three people had already been shot by these suspects. It wasn't until later on we learned they were responsible for seven other robberies that night. I didn't know until later that I had struck the suspect in the leg that fled on foot. He was arrested at the hospital claiming he was robbed. I was able to identify him from a photo array and his buddies turned on him for a plea deal. Not to mention the bullet in his leg matched my gun. I guess they didn't want the charge of aggravated assault on an officer. I'd been an officer for about five years at that time and it was the third time I'd been shot at. The second time I had to shoot somebody. I'm grateful to God I didn't have to kill him or anyone that night. I had enough of that during the war. During my time in law enforcement I've been shot at six times. You never get used to it. You just pray your training will take over and you'll do the right thing. This particular case scared me half to death. Not that I would die, but something just as bad where I might be to blame. I was working street crimes in an undercover car riding around the housing projects looking for drug dealers. It was in the time when crack cocaine was everywhere. I pulled into one complex which was about 10 two-story buildings separated by some green space very similar to some of the buildings featured on the TV show The Wire. I saw a thickly built man standing in the back parking lot. I gave him a quick what's up sign by holding my hands out the window palms up. He quickly motioned for me to park in the back parking lot. I got out of the car and walked up to him. The conversation went like this. What do you need? What do you got? I'm looking for rock. We negotiated for a $20 rock, crack cocaine and I pulled out a 20 and he opened his hand and showed me a handful of small pieces of something that looked like crack and I picked one. 
The next thing I did was really stupid. I went against all my training and attempted to make an arrest from an undercover position. That's a big no-no in narcotics. I had a partner waiting scrunched down in the car as backup, so I went for it. I grabbed the hand with the rocks and pulled my other hand out of my coat pocket which had handcuffs which were loaded. That's the term we use for holding a pair of hinged handcuffs in a position where you can just strike the person's wrist with the cuff and it will snap onto him. I was confident that once I got one cuff on I could take him to the ground using the leverage of the hinged cuffs. Before he knew what happened the cuff hit his wrists and he was mine. Or so I thought. As the cuff flipped around his wrist it caught his jacket sleeve and flipped back open. From that point the fight was on. He wasn't trying to hurt me but he was sure trying to get away. It was a two minute all out wrestling match between the dealer, my partner and me before we could get him in cuffs. I was so tired I can remember just laying on him for a minute or two totally out of breath. But that wasn't the scary part. We scooped up some pieces of crack off the ground as evidence and transported him back to the station. He kept saying they were phony and weren't actually cocaine. My partner left and I stayed to process this guy on a sale charge and put him in jail. In the processing room there was a metal bar which was bolted to the wall next to a bench which was also bolted down. The bar ran horizontal and was about 4 foot long and was about 3 feet off the ground. He sat on the bench with one of his wrists cuffed to the bar. I started processing the guy and he asks me for a drink of water. I see him trying to wet his lips with his tongue so I go into the next room and get him a drink. When I return he's hanging by his wrist still attached to the bar and his eyes were rolled in the back of his head and he's shaking. To put this into context, about a year prior we had a suspect who died in an ambulance on the way to the hospital after passing out in that very same room cuffed to that very same bar from a drug overdose. The people of our city went into an uproar and we had protests, marches, and civil unrest for probably three weeks. It was now clear this guy must have eaten a lot of crack cocaine during our wrestling match. We weren't waiting for any ambulance. I carried him to a patrol unit and raced him to the hospital just two miles away. I can't start to describe the sheer panic of knowing you're racing a dying person you just fought with to the hospital. I honestly thought he would die and it would be my fault. Why did I try to arrest him when I was undercover? I could have arrested him on the sale charge at any time. Now he may die and it was because I broke an important rule of undercover work. I had a very long night as his blood pressure was off the charts with high numbers being way over 200. I was sure he was going to die and I would be found responsible for his death. They pumped his stomach and did some other things to get his blood pressure down and he survived. The attending doctor said it was a very close call and he cheated death this time. ER doctors and nurses are heroic. When he woke up I was there and I told him he scared me half to death. I sat with him most of the night and we talked. He was still my prisoner until he was cleared. Over the course of eight hours we actually gained a lot of respect for each other and he had become a valuable person to talk to about things going on in the streets. After that, as a sergeant and later as a watch commander, I would personally inspect anyone brought to the station who had run from or struggled with the police. Later as the patrol commander, this became a departmental policy. I would look at their pupils, I would watch their respiration, and I would talk to them to make sure they were alright. No one else is going to overdose on my watch or in my department. I was on patrol behind a strip mall when I got a call about someone being attacked in the front parking lot of the bar in the front of the mall that I was at. I drove around to the front in seconds knowing that backup was minutes away. As I pulled up, one man had a long iron pole in his hands raised up as if he was ready to strike another man on the ground with it. The other was looking up at him with his hands up apparently defensively, and there was a huge crowd surrounding this area so even though it looked like a deadly force situation I decided not to draw my gun. This was before tasers. I literally walked right up to them and using my voice of command told them to drop the pole. The man holding the pole started to say something but I told him again in a tone of voice that he could not mistake or argue with and he dropped it. 
I kicked the pole out of reach under a car and stood myself directly between these two men who just moments ago appeared like they were ready to kill each other. I told both of them to say nothing and stay still until the other officers began to arrive. From a purely tactical standpoint, it was probably the stupidest move I ever made. I knew nothing about these two men or why they appeared to be ready to kill each other. I had no idea who in the crowd was on which side, if either, and here I was standing within arm's length of them dominating and controlling a potentially deadly force situation with nothing more than fearless officer presence. As it turned out, I had done exactly the right thing, although I would have been justified in shooting the man with the pole, if I could have done so without putting anyone in the crowd at risk. What was discovered after interviewing the two men and witnesses in the crowd was that the man holding the pole was the bar bouncer, and the man on the ground had been kicked out of the bar earlier and was not happy about it. He tore down a street sign for the iron pole and waited to ambush the bouncer with it at closing time. As it happened, the bouncer had managed to grab it and pull it away from the man, pulled it away with enough force that it was over his head the moment I arrived. The man on the ground of course had his hands raised as the pole had just been pulled out of them by the bouncer. If I had used my gun, I would have shot the bouncer who was defending himself from his attacker. I had arrived at just the right moment when everything appeared exactly the opposite. I took command of a potentially deadly situation with no backup and without using a weapon, and as a result wound up not shooting the wrong person. This is the most memorable moment of my career, and although no one else at the time had a clue, the scariest. Standing between two guys who appeared to have the intent of killing each other. This is the reality of police work. Split second life or death decisions made with minimal information and putting ourselves in imminent danger to minimize the risk to onlookers and others on the scene. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you're subscribed, hit that notification bell down below so you know when I post new content, because there's been a lot of it lately. And if you want even more exclusive content and to help the channel, I would highly recommend becoming a patron, and I would appreciate it. You can find a link down in the description. I hope everyone's having a great day, and I really do appreciate you checking out this video. Share it with your friends if you want, and I will catch you in the next one. And just remember... It's always scarier if it's true. Bad bye. I used to be a farmer back in the day, but due to the current economy, I had to go into producing computers. Honestly, I don't know what producing computers means. I just kind of put them together in a factory. But I do miss the fields. There's nothing like being out at sunset watching your crops grow. Very, very slowly. Hop on that old big old tractor and just cruise around and say, Hello, piggy. Hello, cow. How you doing, chicken? But I'd have to say the scariest experience was one of those nights where I was out saying hello to my animals. I got to the horse stables and I decided to get out and have a peek at my little baby boys. I got in there and it was completely silent. I started calling out to my baby boys. Sugar nut. Lockjaw, where you at boys? Complete silence. I kick on the stable lights and to my horror their stalls are empty. In their place is just a rose. In a panic I ran back to my tractor and drove it as fast as I could back to my place and grabbed my 12 gauge shotgun before heading back out out there. I called my wife on my nice cellular device that I had just gotten from Verizon. It cost an arm and a leg, but it was great to have out in the fields. You know, sometimes you're really far from the house, and if you just have a walkie-talkie, your wife's not around, you're like, Hey woman, pick up that damn girl walkie-talkie. But she don't pick it up. But now I got a cell phone and it rings. No excuses now, little lady. I tell my wife that the horses are missing. And that's when she informs me that she sent them to Shirley's house. She told me to pick up the rose in the middle and look at the note attached. And that's what I did. On that note said, your horses are gone, punk, and I'm leaving you. Sign the divorce paperwork. Now. P.S. I'm taking the chickens. They're mine. Deal with it.
I quickly picked up my cellular communication device and dialed home. No answer. I hop on my tractor and head as fast as I can back to the house. She's gone. And so's the car. I felt my heart leap out of my chest. I hope she didn't take those chickens. I raised those chickens since they were little eggs. I used to get a whole bunch of 12 packs from the store and try to incubate them and just keep the ones that lived and they were my little preciouses. I hopped back on my trailer and went out to my chicken coop. They were gone. The End